All right, welcome everyone to this session. Do we really do FP in Java by Ben Evans? We are glad that he could join us today. Without further delay, over to you, Ben. Good morning, everyone, or uh, good afternoon um, for those, those folks here in India. And, and thank you for the, the introduction, uh, Ashish. Let me uh, just, first of all, share my screen. And also, so you get a couple of seconds to look at my, my lovely desktop while I, while I start up my keynote share. So um, welcome, everybody. So the title of my topic is, do we really do functional programming in Java? For those people who haven't met me before, my name is Ben Evans. I'm a senior principal software engineer uh, at Red Hat. And before Red Hat, I've done a bunch of things. I was lead architect for instrumentation at New Relic. Uh, I was a co-founder of, of Clarity with Martin Verberg, and uh, which we, was acquired by Microsoft in 2019. And then before that, I spent a lot of time working in finance. So I was chief architect for listed derivatives at Deutsche Bank. Uh, I worked at Morgan Stanley during the Google IPO, which was, oh gosh, 17 years ago now. That's, uh, that's a long time. Um, and I've also had a, a career in gaming as well. As well as my career, I have done a bunch of things in the community. I am a Java champion and a Java One Rockstar speaker. Um, I worked on the Java Community Process Executive Committee, which is the body which, which um, decides upon and, and approves all new Java standards. Uh, so I did that for six years. And I'm, I'm also alone. I, I live in Barcelona now, hence, hence my T-shirt, which shows the Barcelona skyline. Uh, but I lived in London for, for, for 20 years, and I did a lot of, of work with the London Java community, helping to organize a big community and also founding a couple of projects, including one that you might have heard of called Adopt Open JDK. Okay, so we're going to talk about, about functional programming and, and what that means in Java uh, today. Now, there, you may have seen a version of this talk, which is available, um, that I gave at JBCMConf last year. That one is, I guess, more um, orientated towards people who are Java programmers rather than folks who are um, uh, specifically functional programmers. So I'm going to take a slightly different direction. So if you've already seen the video, that's fine. We're going to cover obviously quite a bit of the same ground, but we're also going to take it in a different direction for, for, for quite a lot of it, because it's really those functional aspects that I want to, um, to talk about today. The story of functional programming in Java really starts, I guess, with Lambda 8, or with Java 8 and Lambdas, of course. You know, this is the point Java had not really had a notion of Lambdas before that, not as a first level language um, construct, if you like. Now, of course, it was always possible to do the sorts of things that, that, we, that we do with Lambdas in earlier versions of Java. You know, in Java 7 and, and earlier versions, which is quite old now, it was always possible to, to, to write a, a little tiny inner class, um, which only had one, one method on it, and that, that was that was then you know understood to be uh, you know semantically the same as as a lambda expression, but in practice it, it was pretty clunky and it, it didn't have you know functional programming to me is not just about the bare bones and the the, the semantics uh, of what it means to be functional and to be a function. Um, there is a certain amount of syntax and other aspects blended into it. Um, and, and that's a theme that I think I'll come back to a few times during the course of this morning's talk. Um, so Java 8 is really the point which people focus on, because at that point you have Lambda expressions and you know the, the, the aim is that um, within Java's type system, a Lambda is automatically converted to uh, an instance of a class which implements some target functional interface as they're known in Java. Um, which is basically Java's equivalent of a function type. Okay, I have more to say about that, but that, that's the sort of basic basic feel of it. I, I guess anyone that's programmed Java in recent years will kind of know that, but that's that's the framing context. So why 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 do we do that in Java? Um, I I would say that there are really five reasons. You know, the the, the point is is to to provide a, a a usage which is much more expressive, so that rather than having the functional nature hidden behind all of these tiny little inner classes instead that you know you can actually see things by writing function literals and having them auto converted that's much more expressive it's clearer it's it's more concise you know the library code is is easier to understand as well these top three reasons i think are really really important um there's also the question about improved program safety people debate this one 
Uh, I think it certainly has helped. I think I think that the, the the nature of the way that Java's lambdas are constructed, with what are called single abstract method types, actually does improve people's overall safety quite a bit. The one thing which I um I think is 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 more debatable, and I've kind of ranked these five properties that we wanted to get out of lambdas in order of importance, in order of you know for the project to be successful. If they've delivered, you know, top down on these five things, then 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 that's great. The bottom one is data parallelism. Now, before Lambdas first came out, when, when all, all we had was Java 7 and Java 8 was the new thing, there was a lot of talk about how this would automatically enable Java programs to make to take better advantage of multi-core environments. And, you know, you can kind of automatically spread out over the cores um, by taking advantage of data parallelism. This has not happened. This one, I think, is the only one of the five that we, we can raise a question about as to whether it was really successful. Um, or whether it, it really hasn't caught on in the way that, that people might think. And I think the reason for that is it's, you know, automatic parallelism is really hard. You know, first of all, if you have a stream of tasks, which is, is in, in Java, how we, how we do it, we have an abstraction called a stream, which is, is sort of lazily evaluated. Um, and the, the, the data items flow through it. And you think, well, okay, well, if I can split all these up to do some sort of aggregate operation on them, Providing the ordering doesn't matter and providing there's no dependency between them, maybe I can do something. And all those things are true. Um, but actually, it turns out that for quite a large range of, of um, stream sizes or, or collection sizes, if you like, um, the improvement for parallelizing is not great. And in fact, the, the communication overhead in terms of something like Amdahl's law um, plays such a big part of this that it's actually not clear how useful automatic parallelization really is. Certainly, I've been in the, the uh, 10 plus years since uh, since Java came out. Um, I think I've, is it 10 plus or was it, was it 2014? Let me see. Uh, Java 18 came out in 2021. Java 11 therefore came out in 2018, so it must have been around 2014, so, so not quite 10 years, eight years, eight years since Java 8 came out. I've seen a lot of code bases in that time, and I think I've seen the, the, the use of parallel streams maybe half a dozen times. And of those half a dozen times, it was actually incorrect in three of them. So that's not a good track record. And at least a couple of the other cases, the remaining three, it was marginal whether it provided any performance improvement at all. So it's a lot of work for a performance technique which has not, in practice, proved to be useful. So, okay, well, four out of five is not bad. You know, we, we get the first three pretty clearly. So that's that's a success. And, and Lambdas, you know, have been successful. They have been adopted by Java programmers uh, in in uh, you know, huge numbers. Basically, you know, the, the uptake of Java 8 was the fastest uptake uh, uptake and release of Java in history. Um, people wanted Lambdas, so it's become very much part of the Lambda culture, of the, the Java programming culture. But is it functional? Well, let's dig deeper. So the standard thing, you know, if you want to, to say, say any language is functional, you have to be able to treat code as if it was data, right? You have to be able to have some notion of a function literal and be able to pass these things around like any other objects. Now, in Java, as we know, there are two types of values. Well, at least until Project Valhalla comes along, whenever that will be. But for right now, there are two types of values. There are bit patterns, AKA primitives, which are identity free. Um, they have no object header, they have no identity. They are just patterns of bits. And you have object references. That's it. Those are the only types of Java value that exist. Not just on Java values, at JVM level. So other, other JVM um, languages, such as Scala, um, Clojure, et cetera, also have to work within that data model. Now, is a Lambda expression a pattern of bits? No, clearly not. Therefore, it is an object reference. So when we talk about, about Lambdas, what we actually are immediately led to is the fact that they are, they are objects. So, so the closest thing that we can build to a function in the JVM is an object. Now you could imagine a very, very simple case. We want an, an object which has no fields. I'll come back and talk about lambdas and capturing later, but 
for now, no fields. And it has one extra method. Java, of course, has a, a strict inheritance hierarchy. So our, the type that our function object will, um, will implement, uh, will, will be, the simplest thing it can be is a subclass of object with one extra method on it. And that basically is where the concept of a, a SAM type or single abstract method comes from, or an interface which only has one non-default method on it. And that is the simplest, the most minimal representation of a function that we can make. And that idea has been around semantically since, since Java 1.1, when inner classes first arrived. Um, so that's, that's the basis. That's what, what all of this stuff right down in the JVM is gonna be implemented at. Now, as you, as you, I'm sure you, you remember, the way that this works is the Lambda expression is converted to an object which has the appropriate type. And what is that type? It is a direct subclass of object that implements the appropriate target type interface. Okay. As a result, we also, we also get that the, 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 the static typing of Java applied to the method signature must also work. So the compiler is able to check that at compile time and say, ah, yes, you've, you've passed in the correct, the correct form of method to satisfy the signature of the abstract method which has been generated. Under the hood, this uses, well, a couple of things. It uses an API called method handles. And a method handle is kind of like reflection. So if you've used Java reflection, method handles are quite similar. It's sort of a lower level technique. It's not as well known. Um, but in fact, it's become increasingly important. So much so that in the latest version of Java, reflection has actually been replumbed to use method handles. But until Java 17, there were two separate internal APIs for doing um, reflection and introspection at runtime. There was the reflection API and then there was method handles. Method handles were used for lambdas and for some other things which we'll talk about. And the, the reflection API has now been just rebased on top of the on top of uh, on top of method handles. So two APIs still exist: the reflection API, the method handles API. But underneath there is only one implementation, and that is method handles. So this speaks to the transition, the change of Java towards something which is using more of this deep level technology, which is more advanced and more sophisticated down in the runtime, but also provides us with something which looks as though it's, uh, it's closer to a, uh, a functional language. So lambdas, despite the similarities, despite the fact that you might have guessed that, that this is just syntactic sugar over inner classes, that is not the case. Instead, there is a new mechanism in the JVM, let's say new, it's been around since Java 7, um, but it's been a very slow burn for how, how much it's starting to, to, to spread throughout the platform. It's called Invoke Dynamic. Um, interestingly, Invoke Dynamic, one of the things it enables you to do is it enables you to, um, to change the implementation of Lambdas. So the first versions of Lambdas that came out in Java 8 update zero, uh, are different to today's lambdas. The implementation for how lambdas are implemented has been modified in a backwards compatible way. You can take Java 8 bytecode and you can apply it to a Java 17 runtime and you will see a different implementation be used without recompilation. This is one of the powers that, that in, Invoke Dynamic has. It's an extremely powerful mechanism. It's been well thought out and well designed. Um, it uses a new bytecode called Invoke Dynamic which is the first genuinely new bytecode that Java has ever had. And to date, it's still the only one that's new. Valhalla bring a couple of new ones, but until that happens, Invoke Dynamic is all we've got. You can relax parts of the, of the, 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 the static typing system here. Um, you, can, you can do all sorts of really cool things with Invoke Dynamic and Method Handle. Um, the other thing which is, which is awesome about it is that it, in many cases, it's now as fast as regular method dispatch. Um, the old, whole idea behind this, one of the goals was to reimagine reflection in a way that was as performant uh, as, as regular code and without the performance hits that reflection had. Okay, so there's some cool stuff happening at VM level is the takeaway from here. Uh, but what about, you know, the, the actual functionalness of it? How, how much does this provide us with a basis for doing real functional programming? Well, the other piece of Java lambdas is... A move from external iteration 
where we have the Java collections, the client code has control. You know, when you get an iterator and you loop over it, and this, this is external iteration. You deal with individual elements one at a time. You have to deal with boilerplate. You are exposing to a certain degree a level of internal implementation. This is sort of encapsulation violating. And you can, you can argue about how significant it is. Um, but there's no getting away from the fact that the idea of, 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 of functional collection handling is to do internal iteration, is to, is to provide the collection, the aggregate, to have control. And then to be able to say, here is a function which describes what I want done. Now, how you do that is up to you. You know, just, just go, and, go and deal with it. Go and do the needful. Run this function over the collection. Uh, and that basically is to, to reduce boilerplate and to, to, to allow the, 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 the scope of the code to collapse. You know, part of, of this, I said that the syntax matters a, a lot, not, not well, as much as the semantics, it's hard to say. The two are tied together. Without clear, concise syntax, you cannot compress meaning in the way that we can with, with functional approaches. That's, that's, that's the idea that by having transparency, we can, we can put more code, more concentrated code on the page and still have it be comprehensible to the programmer. So syntax does matter for that. Uh, and that's one of the areas where, where Java, as we'll see, does fall down. So what have we ended up with? We've ended up with functions as first class values. We've ended up with filter map reduce. We've ended up with a, a Java um, util function package, which has some function objects in it with functional composition and things like that, right? This is table stakes, in my opinion. Is this functional programming? Well, maybe. What I would say is that it gives us a view of Java's type system, which I can express like this now. So I think this is really a, a decent description of Java uh, 8 or 11. With 17, of course, we've got, you know, the, the amount to which this is slightly functional is, is shifted. And I'll have something to say about some of these, these specific words a bit later on. Um, but you know, if I use, use words to describe Java's type system like static and nominal and object imperative, type raised, modestly type inferred, and slightly functional, that is, you know, and if at this point you, you want to go and watch another talk, by all means do. That's kind of my conclusion. Um, I think there's an interesting journey to be had to explain that and to also provide some nuance around what I mean precisely by slightly functional here. Um, but that's that's essentially the conclusion. Like we are not going to ever turn Java into Haskell. So let's let's take a step forward and see what is it that would make a language function, what, what else could we add? Well, I would argue that for, for, th for things which are really functional, it's a question of how many of these seven things do you have? So this is kind of like my magnificent seven for functional programming. We want to talk about purity of functions. We want to talk about immutable data. We want to talk about higher order functions, curl recursion, closures, laziness, and currying. Those are the seven things which, which you know, I, I say, if you're going to go beyond just, just simple lambdas, closures, and um, and filter map reduce. This is the next the next step. It's a big step. It's a big step up from where where languages like Java are to the next level. So so how do we do? Okay, so pure function, function that doesn't alter the state of any entity, side effect free, behaves like a mathematical function. This is the standard description that we have of pure functions. Um, and because it, is, it returns results are dependent only on the arguments and not on any external state, which could be modified, it, it's, it's transparent and you, you, you can memoize it and so on and so forth. Now, the JVM, of course, doesn't have functions. <coughs> Excuse me. So the JVM has methods. And the way that the, 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 the JVM is structured is that code goes into methods um, and the, the methods go into classes and um, the, the, the classes go into packages and packages go into, go into modules. So there is, there is a, a hierarchy of namespaces, a hierarchy of scopes as you go up. But the, the fundamental point is that the JVM only loads and links classes. It is the minimum unit of functionality that the JVM will ever deal with. Um, so, so that is, um, 
that is a, a, you know, a, 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 a basic point of the Java security model. You can't just take a free function and load it in. There's no way of doing it. It has to come in through a class, which of course is another constraint on why, why lambdas in Java have to be function objects. Okay, because they have to be instances of a class which has been linked. So we, don't, we only have methods. So a pure method is one that doesn't modify object or static state. It doesn't contain objects to, to modify fields, which are mutable. Um, it doesn't contain any uh, external state. Um, and it does not call any, any non-pure method. Um, so what else? Well, this is quite a uh, restrictive set of conditions. And I would say that this is one of the places where it shows up the, 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 the real difficulty of using the JVM for pure functional presenting, um, functional programming. Um, and that is, you know, that's not a great start. If we, if we have this, you know, this very much the sense that the JVM is based around mutability, um, that makes it difficult to write um, pure functions. It also makes it difficult to write immutable objects. So immutability is extremely powerful. It makes code much easier to reason about, fundamentally because objects have a trivial state model. They are constructed in the only state that they will ever exist in. And they are, uh, you can copy them around between threads, even between you know, VMs or instances. And the immutability of data is really very, um, very powerful. And in fact, you, know, you, can, you can even extend the idea of, of immutability to say, you know, are there, are there almost, any almost immutable approaches where we still get a lot of the benefits, um, but we can still, we can extend it slightly and make it slightly mutable or, or whatever. Now, of course, famously, Java has string classes and the Java string class is effectively immutable, um, by which I mean that you, you, um, it does have one piece of, of mutable state, but you can prove that any data races which result from computing that state which in the case of Java string class is the hash code, um, that all data races are benign. Uh, and in fact, the way the string class works is the first, you, you check to see whether the, the hash code has been computed, if it has, you use it. And if not, you, have, you can have multiple threads racing to compute the hash code, but they will all end up with the same value. Um, so in that case, it's kind of like a promise or a Java completable future where you, you, you can have multiple threads that race, but the resulting data races are benign. Um, so that is one example of how you can extend immutability. Um, but Java doesn't have great support for it. Yes, we have final, and you can um, mark fields and, and, and local variables as final, and they will not be updated, but only the reference is immutable. So you, you, you can't mark an entire object tree or an object subgraph uh, as being immutable, only the, the first link in it is, is matched. So you have to make sure that it's fi it's final everywhere, and that obviously is prone to bugs. Um, what happens if you need to make use of data which comes from a library which isn't immutable? Your nice reasoning about immutability has been has been broken now. Um, and then of course there are some horrible things you can do with reflection to invalidate it should you wish to, um, but generally speaking, uh, not what uh, not what you should do. So Java does have some attempts to, to do proper immutability. Um, we, we have um, copying and, and withers. So we have things like the Java time API, which was a complete rewrite of the, the unfortunate um, Java util date, original Java functionality for, for, for date and time. So java.time is completely immutable and it, it sets up this idea with, of using factory methods everywhere and these withers. Uh, and that is an idea which is reflected in um, in Project Valhalla, which I've mentioned a couple of times. Okay, so that's immutability. Yes, there is basic support for it, but it is only basic support. Let's move on. Let's take a look at what's next. So next up, we have higher order functions. Now this this is straightforward. It's a, a function which takes either it takes a function as a parameter or it returns a function. So for example, in Java, you have the function types. So that is perfectly fine. You take in a function, which takes in a string and you return a function of strings to strings. So I've called my function, my higher function here, uh, prefixer. It takes in a prefix and it returns a function which, which, which prefixes a string with, with whatever you passed it in. 
Okay, so so far, so, far, so good. We can do that. Um, and as you can see, that we have this code, and you can actually, you know, the the, the Java compiler is smart enough um, to be able to to convert it to this form here. So you don't really need the extra brackets here. You can you can write this all in one line, which is, I guess, is okay. Um, so that's fine. This actually has some subtleties to do with type erasure. Because notice that we have the, the generic type arguments here, that this is, takes in a string and it returns a function of string to string. Turns out there are some corner cases where, where type erasure can, can come back and haunt you. Um, so I shan't, I shan't go into that now. I haven't got enough time, really. Um, and instead, just say that the, 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 the higher order function support in Java is reasonable. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the same poor story that we saw with 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 pure functions, or that kind of half story that we saw with immutability. Oh well, let's move on. Let's talk about recursion. Okay, so the standard view. This is a Java view of 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 a factorial calculation. Um, factorial actually isn't a great example because you basically overflow even Java's longs very very quickly. So if you actually try to use this code, you will find that it gets up to about 31 or 32. Uh, and th I think it's 32 factorial, which is larger than Java's longs. So that's not, um, that's not actually a lot of space to demonstrate the property that we're, we're, we're showing here. But because you get overflow of the, of, of the, the arithmetic long before you actually get a stack overflow exception, um, which by the way, is what happens when you run this. Um, so you you can convert it into a form like this and of course this is a standard trick by using a helper function which is private now in in a language like javascript uh, or something which supports nested functions you could put that nested method inside this one but java doesn't do nested methods so instead you have to use this you have to have a a help helper factorial which takes in two elements and and returns this um you could do this using a Lambda expression, but actually at that point, you'd need a private interface and the resulting bytecode isn't anything like as clear. Whereas this one, I think kind of is, you, you use a two argument. And then if, you, if you've seen this trick before, you, you know what's happening. You're using the fact that you have a two argument function and you are, are storing state effectively in the stack. That's how this, this implement, implementation works. Um, I won't show the byte code for, for the actual the front door function, the tail rep factorial, because it's uh, it's not very interesting. But what I will do is I'll show the byte code for help factorial. So help factor rather. This this takes in two uh, two parameters, both of which are longs. And I don't know if you if, if folks know how to read Java byte code, um, but it's it's this is pretty straightforward. What we did what we're doing is we're taking we're loading our our first argument, loading zero and comparing them. Um, and if, if it's not zero, then we're going to continue down into, the, into this part. If it is zero, we're going to, going to return. So, so byte codes um, zero through, through seven are, are basically the test condition to check to see whether it's zero or not. Um, from byte code eight onwards, um, and if the numbering seems a little strange, by the way, that's because um, Java bytecode, some of the opcodes have arguments to them. So for example, at bytecode three, we have a if not equal instruction, uh, and the target of that is instruction eight. So, so what that means is that the two bytes that follow, bytecode four and bytecode five, are actually the bytes zero, zero and zero, eight. And they're combined to make the target for the jump instruction. So, so that's why the, the, the stream seems to skip from three to six. It actually, it actually uses up some of the stream in order to hold the arguments. Um, okay, and then so for bytecodes eight onwards, we, we produce the two multiplications and then notice that on line 14, we do an invoke static. So we do a recursive call right before the, the, the return. So this is a classic case of tail recursion or generally tail calls. Um, now, we could do this. Notice we, the, the bytecode is identical for bytecode 0 through 13. But now, in this version of this, we produce 
modification of the two the two variables uh, zero and two, and jump back up to the top again. So there we there we go. We are we are, are repeatedly moving through the uh, the code, and when we hit the end, rather than doing another call, we're jumping back to zero again. So this is a conversion of <clears throat> a recursive function call, which in Java is always represented by an invoke instruction into iteration. Okay, so that's that's very standard technique, and some languages do this. So Scala, for example, Kotlin, they will do this, but Java doesn't. In Java, a method call like this one, so help fact, return help fact, i minus one, i times j, is always translated into a, a function call, into a method call. It is never con automatically converted to iteration. And there is no way at Java language level of making it do that. So the tail recursion in Java is not optimized and can blow the stack. Um, you could take some Java code, compile it, and then run some sort of bytecode transformer on it to convert it into the iterative form. And that would be totally legal. And your program would run fine. Um, and that's basically what, what things like Scala do. Um, but by default, Java, without doing that rewriting, Java's tail recursion is not optimized and it will blow the stack. Okay, the reason for this, and there's been some discussion about, about whether we could fix this. Um, and there has been, you know, it's, it's been an idea which has been talked about for at least 10 years. Basically, it comes down to the expectation that, that, that a stack trace produced by Java will be completely valid. So, so that you, you will be able to see every frame on it and that that's more important than, than fully um, optimized cell recursion. Um, I can see that argument, it is a behavior change, um, but there's no getting away from the fact that this, this feels not only suboptimal, but that, that actually it's a bit of a bit of a poor show that we can't really do proper tail recursion here when, when it's clearly possible in other languages. Never mind, move on. What else? Closures. So uh, a closure, broadly a Lambda expression which captures some state. Um, you can think about this type of thing where you, you have a, a lambda who um, which is, is pulling in that i. Um, of course, what happens if we uncomment the line? Hmm, interesting. So for people that don't know, what will happen is your program will fail to compile. Um, Java has a, a requirement that, that any um, parameters that appear in, um, in lambdas, so like the i here, that they have to be either final or effectively final. It is a compilation error to attempt to reassign after the Lambda expression, okay? This restriction is, 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 is I think, a little onerous. Um, I'll explain why it happens in a second, um, but, you, uh, but it, it is there. I personally always preferred that we had to, to explicitly write out the final just to make it clear that we were, we were performing the capture. Um, but other programmers seem to seem to resent that. So now you can get away with it, not writing final int i, providing you don't actually do a reassignment later. So let's take a closer look. Let's look at some more bytecode and see what's actually happening there. So if you look at what, what happens, Lambda bodies in Java are turned into private static methods. That's why they're not really in the classes. If you, if you compile a Java class with the Lambda in it, you will not see a second file on disk, which of course they would be if it was an inner class. So instead the Lambda body has been turned into a private static method and the captured variables are passed as arguments. Um, and so what happens is the, the int, so this is a function from strings to strings. So it's gonna require one, what we call dynamic argument, which is the string, but it's also prepended with the int, which is what we call a static argument. Because the static argument is captured at the point where the Lambda expression is created. So in i, the value of i, 42, is copied as a static argument at, this, at, the, at the point where the object f is created. 
So that is already has already happened, has already been captured. When we execute the line, which creates F, I is captured at that point, and then it's passed into the body of the lambda later on. By the way, if you if you if you're playing along at home, um, if this is Java eight byte code. Uh, the Java 11 and Java 17 byte code will look quite different to, the, to this because the code and the way that string concatenation is done in Java 11 and 17 is, is different to how it's done on Java 8. So, but the, the, the method signature, the fact that you're capturing the end will, is, will be the same. It's just the implementation for the string concatenation is different. Okay, so the big question, this is, this is where we come back to, to think about this from a functional perspective. Is this really a closure? Well, hmm, I'm not sure. Java is strictly a passed by value language. Okay, primitives are passed as the value. Um, objects are passed as a bitwise copy of the reference. Okay, so I call this passed by bit pattern because that's kind of what it is. Um, it's also worth worth noting that that this means um, the the changes to primitives that, that you make, if you if you change modify the primitive inside a um, inside a, a lambda like this one, if you try to modify i here, all you're doing is modifying the copied value. There is no way to pass that back to, to call a context. So languages that, that 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 have a notion of an environment like Scala, I think JRuby as well. There is no notion of, of, of the capturing environment that's, that's being passed in here, because typically closures will pass by reference, and we can't pass by reference for an, uh, a primitive. So non-Java languages that want to support true closures or, or pass by reference, their runtime environments must provide the support for it. The JVM is not going to do that for you out of the box. So that you, if, you want, if you want to do that, you, you have to provide it within the runtime. And I think there might have been a question about that. So I hope that answered the question. OK, how are we doing? OK, I've got about 15 minutes. So let's push, press on. We have five minutes. Five, five minutes, four questions. OK. Yep. So let's speed up a bit. So laziness, values that are not completed until they're needed. Um, Java screens do use laziness. The, the operations are. are usually lazy some of them are eager uh, and generally speaking the um the, the the terminal operation the thing which completes the pipeline of a stream is typically eager as well now that's all that always has to be eager so values are pulled through um through the pipeline until they hit an eager operation where the stream is materialized so for example if you're sorting you need to see the entire stream so that has to be an eager operation but in general as far as possible java streams are lazy but that's it. There's no direct language level support. There's no JVM support for general lazy values. Um, and in fact, not many JVM languages support la laziness directly. Uh, Clojure is, is lazily evaluated and you only have laziness for sequences. Um, that, so so that, that is, you know, laziness is not just a Java problem. It's also a general JVM language problem. Um, I think Java gets a swing and a miss here for this one. Currying and parcel application. So supplying some but not all arguments for a function. Java has no automatic support for currying. And in fact, Java does not have a complete set of general function types. It has function and by function and, uh, and, and operator uh, interfaces, but no general function one through function n, like we see in, for example, Scala. Related to this, Java's syntax also trips us up here because Java's syntax doesn't allow hiding of the method calls. So in a language like Kotlin, you can just have a, 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 an object which contains a function, and you can just have a call syntax on it, which is just some brackets. In Java, that is not allowed. You must always write out the name of the method when you're, when you're calling it. So it's typically the apply method. Uh, and that's why Java code, which uses function objects, is typically more, more verbose. Now, we could imagine a different world. We can imagine something where we decided we did want to do currying in, in Java. So we have the standard interface for a by function, um, which has got an, an application of, of a function to TTU. This is the full generic form where you have TU and R. 
and then you have a, a, a generic default method called and then, which, which is post application. Okay, so you return this, and what you're actually doing is you're binding up some, some data inside it by returning a, a new Lambda expression. So you can then imagine that we would actually have two functions like this, a, um, a curry left and a curry right, where basically you would just apply different functions to this. Okay, so the main problems that we're seeing with the type system and collections uh, are that Java's type system is not single rooted. Int and object do not have anything to do with each other as types. So what that means is you cannot put an int into list, for example. There are also problems with void um, and the design of the Java collections uh, in themselves implies mutability. Mutability is not a well-separated concern of, the, of, of the, the Java collections interfaces. So, and they, all of the collections have on them modification and, and adding methods. And the way that that's handled is not, is not good. Um, if, you, if you try to, to use a method, if you want to define an, a, a, an immutable collection, like a, a, a oh, I don't know, an immutable uh, list, for example, the way that you would do that is you would throw unsupported operation exception on any attempt to modify. Now that's not an acceptable solution in my opinion, because unsupported operation exception is a, um, is a runtime exception, so it's unchecked, and there is nothing in calling code which will tell you that it might do that. Um, so there's no encoding of the, of the, the immutability of, the, of the, the, the implementation at type level. Streams get some things right, but the problems with streams are collections of first class and they are embedded everywhere through the JDK. Lots and lots of, um, of, of, of the JDK uses the collections in all sorts of places. Streams are not, because streams were only added in Java 8, they have limited applica applicability. It's also true that Java has no type level traversable concept, as we see in Scala. So we have a you know just only the ability to to iterate with iterable. There is no notion of a type which represents an internally iterable um, uh, object. The collections, in addition, are not functional uh, collections. They don't have any ability to do map and filter. They're not functionally transparent. Streams are somewhat, but there is a limit to how far you can push that. And in particular, because of the, the necessity of using the stream construct as, first, as not first class, flat map is extremely limited in Java and it's not obvious and it's not intuitive how to use it. So lots of Java programmers don't really, they do map and filter and reduce, but they get very worried as soon as flat map shows up. Okay, so the, here is our type system. It's static, it's enforced. We, we use class files for everything. And, you know, I, I think, I kind of like this quote from my, my buddy Curtis Poe about strong and weak typing. So I always make sure I say static typing. Java's types are nominal. They are, we, are, we are not a structural typing language at all. Types are only compatible if explicit inheritance exists and everything has a, has a name, at least for L values. So for at least for things which are on the left-hand side when assignment, that is the only way to talk about the type is by name and there is no duck typing. The OO model is one of Java's strong points. It's very simple. It's not pure OO. It simplifies teaching it because you have primitives. Uh, it's type erased because we have parameterized types that only exist at, um, at compile time. And the, 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 the generation of bytecode removes information. Information is destroyed even at class file level. Lots of people complain about this. It's often quite misunderstood. Um, and finally, slightly functional things. The collections are very concrete. Um, and the final point is, it is only slightly functional, but does it matter? Java developers are, are well used to Lambda expressions now. They're well used to, to the, the, the support of map, filter, and reduce, and basic functional patterns. And perhaps that's all they need. If people would grow up to be functional programmers and decide that that's the style of programming that works for them, there are plenty of other languages to choose from. There is Clojure and Scala and Kotlin and Haskell beyond that. So perhaps in the end, it's not very functional, but it doesn't really matter. Thanks very much. If, you, if you're if interested in, in approaching this more deeply from, from the Java point of view, and also talking about closure on Kotlin, my new book, The Well-Grounded Java Developer, has got a lot of material about, about this topic in it.
Thanks for having me today. Yep. Thank you, Ben. We do have one question, uh, one more question it's from Michelle. Uh, does modern Java support pattern matching or are there any plans of what you are aware of to support it? Would you think it's an important feature of uh, FP language? Yes. Okay, so this is a really interesting subject. So I've talked all the way through about a, um, a project called Valhalla. And at the moment, the future of Java, there are four main projects that are in flight to, um, to evolve Java into, into its next major form, if you like. And it's kind of like Pokemon evolution forms. Um, but the, 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 the next form which is going to come is really defined by two of those projects. One of them is Project Valhalla, which is a rethinking of the data model and is about VM level concerns. That will you know, solve some of the functional programming problems for us, things around unification of the type system um, and, and dealing with, with, with primitives versus object references. So that solves a bunch of nasty problems that there are uh, in one part of the language. Um, but the other project, the one which I think is, is closer to, to, to the, the developer, is called Project Amber. And Project Amber is different from the other projects because it's been focused on small incremental changes into the, the language as time has gone on. So Java now has a release cadence of every six months. So we, we're actually seeing that new versions are coming out and little increments to the language are being delivered. Probably the first one was switch expressions. So this basically it was a first step towards pattern matching by changing Java's switch uh, statement, which is very, very C-like, and providing a form of it which actually uses uh, is, is an expression. So from there, the, the intent was to expand the notion of what switch could be by introducing patterns. So patterns were actually introduced first, not in the switch statement, but actually in Java's instance of. So basically that provides a, a pattern which, which matches against the type, but then also introduces a new local variable which is scoped to, to, the, to the block. Um, but is of the appropriate type. So that is the basic first instance of a pattern. And incrementally, things are being added to the language now. Um, because Java has a process which adds in features using um, what are called preview features. So a feature shows up, and you can only use it by explicitly enabling it. Um, and then we do a couple of iterations of that until, until the feature is solid. And then it becomes a final part of the language. So where we are with Java 17, which came out last September and is the most com current and up-to-date version is, we have some we have switch expressions, um, we have the, the type patterns, uh, and that's kind of about it. There are some other things which you can switch on um, by, by, by adding on, on the preview features, but it's still in the process of being delivered. The intent is to, you, to deliver an entire set of, of, um, of features for pattern matching, but we're still getting there. Now, the other thing which has, has also been added related to that is algebraic data types. So Java 17 supports records, um, which are product types, uh, and it also supports sealed types, which are some types. So though that's, that, that, that is one really nice feature. And with, with just the addition of, of algebraic data types, there has been some, some movement there as well. Um, Okay, should we take another question? All right, we do. We have two more. Uh, Jyotish is asking, so is it not recommended to do FP in Java? Better to use other suitable languages. What's your opinion about writing FP style code in Java? Uh, you, well, you can do it. I mean, you, of course you can do it. Lots of, And it depends what you mean. That's one of the, the messages of the talk is that it depends what you mean by functional programming. Right? Everybody has a different view. Functional programming is not a monolithic thing any more than object oriented programming is a thing. You know, I, I sometimes say about OO that you could name any property of, the, of OO languages and I can find you an example of a language which we both agree is object oriented and which does not have the feature that, that, you, that you mentioned. You know, so you can say classes and I can say JavaScript. You can say encapsulation and I can say Perl. You know, and we can, it's, FP is like that. Different languages have different takes on, on what FP is. 
Um, and I always think that rather than it being, you know, a binary, is this language FP or not? It's a question of a sliding scale and also of personal preference. What works for you? What works in, you know, in, in the way that you choose to program? So can you write FP code in Java? Yes, of course you can. Um, and an experienced programmer who has learned to program in an FP language quite often will write better Java code when they come back to Java and they apply what they've learned. This is why I think it's important to have, have the different styles and to, to have experience in, in several different languages and seven different, several different styles of languages because they are, um, you know, they, they provide you know, insight and a better way of approaching problems in, you know, even in a language which is not formally in that in that uh, in that style and tradition. Okay, should we take another one? Yeah, we have last one. I will take last question, and maybe next questions can be taken up at the hangout area. So, the last is what are the other languages that overpass the Java in FP? Also, will Java be able to catch? those other FP languages? Okay, so th there's a couple of things here. So first of all, it depends on, on whether you're talking about languages which run on the JVM or not. Now, again, this is a choice. This is a trade-off that engineers have to make. Um, the JVM is the, the, the most well-tested and, and highest performing general purpose language runtime that we have. You know, I'm not knocking Beam. Beam is a great virtual machine. Um, but the, the, the JVM is, ju is just much more widely deployed um, and, you know, in its domain, which is general purpose, specifically general purpose, it can't be beaten. So you decide, do you want to stay on the JVM or do you want to go somewhere else? If you want to go somewhere else, then Beam is an excellent choice. You know, you have Erlang and things like that. Um, or if you want to go down the statically type route, you, you, have, you have Haskell. But both of those approaches require you to leave the JVM. And it's a rich ecosystem and it's community and it's ease of finding programmers and all of the things which make you want to be on the JVM, you lose if you go to one of those, those non-JVM languages. So to answer that question, what about non-Java languages on the JVM? Okay, sure. You basically have a choice of three. You, um, the three ma major non-Java languages which do FP well, I would say, are Kotlin, Scala, and Clojure. And of those languages, Kotlin is a, a modern Java. It's, it's basically someone designed a language with all the things that we've learned about Java over 20 plus years and made them in, in, into a language which was better at doing FP, had a, a, cleaned up a lot of the rough edges, had a lot of nice new language features that people find uh, to be productive. So, so that, is, um, that is why what, you know, Kotlin is essentially a better mousetrap a better version of Java, which does have better FB support. So if you want that, have that. Now, Scala, Scala is an interesting case because it's been around for a long time. Scala has been around since before Java 8 came out. So it goes back to at least Java 6, that sort of time frame. And it was originally designed as a research language, which just got more popular in industry. And originally, Scala was the, the way of doing functional programming um, that was better than Java. It, it was the better mousetrap. And instead, it's now moved on to become its own thing. So Scala is now a very solidly functional programming language. Um, and I, I used to make jokes that, that sometimes in, in the Scala community, you'd find, you'd find two sorts of folks. You'd find folks that wanted to write Haskell on the JVM and folks that just wanted a better Java. And over time, I think the language has developed much more in this strongly functional direction. So it's an excellent choice if that's, if that's what you want. Um, at the cost of moving further away from Java. Um, and then there's Clojure. And Clojure is different again. It's dynamically typed. So it's not a statically typed language in the same way that Java is. Um, it has a, a very interesting, very lightweight runtime. Um, it's very Lisp. It's, people can argue about whether Clojure is really a Lisp dialect or not. I tend to think of it as a Lisp dialect with just a bit of extra syntax. Um, I really like it. I actually do do programming closure from time to time if I have something which I feel like I you know want to, want to explore it a bit more. Um, so yeah, so that's your, your your choice. Do you want something a bit like Java but better? Do you want something which is is statically typed and and heading more off in the Haskell direction, in which case you pick Scala, or do you want something dynamically typed and a bit lispy, in which case closure? So as with everything in software, 
it depends what you're looking for and it depends what you're you're trying to achieve for them.